Much love and respect. Pura vida, mi gente. Thanks for tuning in once again. Appreciate you guys taking the time to do that always. Today we're going to be talking about, uh, again, the Davenport tablets. I got the original source here from the original people who found these tablets. We're going to read uh, first here from the Proceedings of the Davenport Academy of Natural Sciences. This is volume two. There's many volumes of this. This is from 1879. And again, when it comes to the Davenport tablets, it was already confirmed to be official back in these times, 1870s, 1880s. Later on, people started claiming it was fraudulent and that it was a hoax. And that was only because it didn't fit the mainstream narratives of history. Tablets like these are not supposed to be found in ancient America, especially when they're showing old world inscriptions on them and things that are very controversial that would rewrite history. So this is why I wanna read this to you guys, the original report. So we're going to go ahead and go to page 92 here. And we're going to start right here. So where we are right here, they're talking about uh, explorations they did in certain mounds in Iowa, specifically in Davenport. And I believe the area is called Cook Farm or Cook's Farm. And it says here, Dr. R.J. Farquharson or Farquharson or Farquharson reported a considerable correspondence in regard to the tablets recently discovered by the Reverend Mr. Gass, and that much interest had been manifested in them, and serious doubts expressed as to their genuineness. If truly the work of the mound builders, they were by far the most important relics that have yet been found. In order to satisfy these doubts, Mr. Gass has prepared a detailed statement and complete history of the mound in which these tablets were found. The following paper was read. It says here a connected account of the explorations of mound number three, Cook's Farm Group by Reverend J. Gass, to the Academy of Natural Sciences. Although a second partial report of the explorations of the mound designated in volume one of these proceedings as mound number three of the Cook Farm Group has been submitted it seems to be desirable to present a more particular description in connection with diagrams so as to afford a connected representation of all these facts and the results of the investigation, and especially so as some errors occurred in the former description and illustration, and also from the fact that on account of recent discoveries, this mount has become an object of essential interest. My own ideas regarding the discoveries I will present on future occasion given here only the facts okay he's just gonna 
stay to the facts. So right here, this diagram, it shows you to the left is south, to the right is north. Figure eight shows a scale about 10 feet to one inch uh, inside the mound. And the letters here is telling you what they're finding. It says mound number three is the largest of this group and is situated on the highest ground in the vicinity. So I just want to show A is the position of limestones met within the in, with the first excavation, one foot below the surface. B is the position of human remains first met with. C, upper shell bed. D, lower shell bed. E, cavity excavated at the north side of grave A. F is the position of the tablets is where they found them. S, limits of shell bed bordered by row of layer stones. Its diameter at the base is about 60 feet in height, three and one half feet above the natural grade, having been many years under cultivation. Its height has doubtless been thereby somewhat reduced. The form is not conical, but considerably flattened as shown by the diagram, figure eight. It is a so-called double mound, there being in the central point, two graves extending east and west and parallel to each other, separated by three to four feet of earth and designated by A and B. Each grave is about six feet wide and nine to 10 feet long and excavated to a depth of two and at one half feet below the natural surface. Reaching to the hard clay in the middle of the excavation, which is sloping on all sides, giving it a concave form, though flattened at the bottom. The actual mound raised over the hole is now only three to four feet above the original surface and presents somewhat the form of a cone. If we divide the mound by a line passing from east to west, through the center, the grave A is in the southern and the grave B in the northern half. And we got another diagram here, so figure nine, as you guys can see. It says explorations of 1874. When in the latter part of 1874, I, with the assistance of W. Engelbrecht and E. Borgelt and H. Decker, all these men, right, all these different uh, men were the ones who explored this mound, who were at that time theological students, explored the other mounds of this group. I opened at the same time the southern grave A of this mound, the details of which work here given full from notes taken at the time. We made an opening several feet in width, and as we afterward found three or four feet to the south of the grave A, at the depth of one foot, we found a scattered layer of limestones. A, under which was a stratum of earth about one foot thick. At the southern side of this opening, one and a half feet from the surface, we discovered two human skeletons. B, from the condition of these skeletons and from their arrangements, and the nature of the objects found associated with them, it is clearly shown that they belong to our century and not to the age of the mound uh, builders, the bones being in a good state of preservation and as if often found in Indian graves covered with the boughs of oak trees. The objects found with these bones were a fire steel, a common clay pipe, a number of shell and glass beads, and a silver earring. A few of the bones exhibit some cuts made apparently by sharp teeth or some cutting instrument. It should also be remarked that fragments of human bones were found scattered through the earth at about the same depths as the skeletons above referred, for example, one and a half feet below the surface. Immediately beneath the above mentioned skeletons was found a thin layer of river shells from one to two inches in thickness, which sloped slightly toward the north sea. At the south side of this excavation, about two feet below the surface, we found a large quantity of ashes. This bed of ashes was beyond the circumference of the shell layer. Hence, we cannot positively determine whether the ashes have been placed there by the mound builders. The layer of shells above mentioned rested upon a stratum of earth, 12 inches in depth, under which was found a second bed of shells, D, three or four inches in thickness. The second layer of shells sloped more abruptly to the northward, which induced us to proceed in that direction until we reached what proved to be the south side of the grave A. Here, at the depth about two feet below, the second shell bed, about five one half feet below the surface, were discovered three skeletons, two of adults and the third 
that of a child lying in a horizontal position on the hard clay, with the heads to the west and the feet to the east. The small skeleton was lying between the two larger ones. At the east end of the grave, we found several small fragments of skulls. All of the bones were covered with loose black earth, all right, black earth, chemic, rich black fertile soil, <laughs> occupying the space between them in the lower shell bed. Immediately in contact with the bones of the child's skeleton were a large number of copper beads. About three inches above the southernmost of the two larger skeletons and near the right shoulder were discovered two copper axes, lying side by side with the sharp edges toward the south. Near the northernmost skeleton were found three copper axes, in the same relative position except that they were about two feet above the bottom of the grave and immediately beneath the lower layer of shells. Numbers one and two were lying side by side with the sharp edge toward the south and number four lying across them with the edge westward. All the axes had been wrapped in cloth, which was more or less imperfectly preserved. A few of the bones of the child were of greenish color, quite well preserved, probably by the action of the copper, while the rest of them, as well as those of the other skeletons, crumbled in pieces as soon as we were uh, as soon as they were removed. So basically what he was saying, even though they found bones on the top layers that might have been more recent than the actual mounds, you know, the time the mounds were built, they actually, they went more, a little more down. There's different layers, right? A stratum. And those are original uh, to the mounds. That's what he's saying here. Just north of the northernmost large skeleton and in a small cavity excavated at the north side of the grave were found the following articles. Sample. First, a number of small red stones arranged in the form of a star. About three inches in diameter, 2D, two carved stone pipes, one having the form of the groundhog and the other a plain one. 3D, several canine teeth of the bear, etc., etc. Fourth, one arrowhead. Fifth, one large broken pot, which is represented restored in figure one with bones of the turtle adhering to the inside of the fragments. Six, two pieces of a galena. Seventh, a lump of yellow ochre. Here I would also mention that at each end of this grave were found several stones of a few pounds weight each. The fact that the bottom of this grave sloped upward and outward in all directions confirmed our opinion that all the contents of this mound had been discovered and a further search would be useless measures Farquharson, tiffany and pratt to whom full permission was given to prosecute a further research concurred in this opinion and did not think it advisable to avail themselves of the opportunity the work on this mound was therefore discontinued and operations command command in an adjacent one it goes on here it says explorations of 1877 in tilling the field containing these mounds, many shells were turned up by the plow last summer on the north side of Mount 3. The circumstance led me to believe that the shell layers extended further to the north than I had formerly supposed, and to consider it probable that on the side opposite to the former excavation, uh, example, on the northern slope of the mound, a second grave might be found north of the first for some other reason, must exist for the extension of the shell layer so far in this direction. My intention to begin in the latter part of the summer, the work of a second excavation was repeatedly frustrated by the unusual wetness of the ground and various private hindrances until the early setting in of severe winter weather made it seem advisable to postpone operations until spring. Learning, however, in December, that the farm was rented to a new tenant who was to take possession of the 1st of March, 1877, and that after that date, the permission to excavate, which had heretofore been freely granted, could no longer be obtained. The shortness of the time remaining induced me to commence a new exploration, in spite of the difficulties attending such work in winter, the ground being frozen to the depth about two one-half feet. Accordingly, on the 10th of January, the weather having somewhat moderated, I commenced the work, assisted by Messrs. Wildroth and Stoltzenau, aided also by five other men, 
whose curiosity attracted them to the spot. Commencing on the north side of the mound, about 15 feet northwest of the grave A, and as we afterward found, about 6 feet from the grave B, we made an opening several feet in diameter. 5 or 6 inches below the surface, we came upon a shell layer, 1 or 2 inches thickness, which sloped downward toward the southeast until at a distance of 4 or 5 feet it reached a depth of 2 feet or rather more from the surface. Between the surface and this first layer of shells, a number of human bones were found, scattered through the soil. Also a number of stones, which as was afterwards observed, were more numerous over the middle of the grave B. Associated with these bones, which like those on the other side of the mound, were doubtless of modern times, we found a few glass beads and fragments of a brass ring. This layer of shells rested upon a stratum of earth from 12 to 15 inches in thickness, and beneath this was a second layer of shells. This layer was from 3 to 4 inches thick and in a sloping position nearly, the, nearly parallel with the upper layer. These indications caused us to continue our excavation in this direction, and so we reached the northwest corner of the grave B. Here the shell layer was 5 inches thick. Below this layer was a stratum of loose black soil or vegetable mound of 18 or 20 inches, resting on the firm undisturbed clay. In this soil were discovered fragments of human bones and small pieces of coal slate or bituminous shell. Okay, so this is what they're telling you. That's how they found it. They kept digging, they kept, you know, looking for stuff. Discovery of inscribed tablets, all right, inscriptions and tablets. These circumstances arrested particular attention and caused me to proceed with more caution until soon after, about five o'clock in the afternoon, we discovered the two inscribed tablets of coal slate, plates one, two, and three, which with other relics from the mound are now in the museum of the academy. The two tablets were lying close together on the hard clay in the northwest corner of the grave, about five and one half feet below the surface of the mound, the larger one to the southward, and the smaller one north of it, F, the smaller one is engraved on one side only, and the larger on both sides. The larger one was lying with that side up, upward, which was somewhat injured by a stroke of the spade. And the smaller with the engraved side upward, both were closely encircled by a single row of limestones. These were covered on both sides with clay, on removal of which the markings were for the first time discovered. A number of fragments of the coal slate lay in the immediate vicinity of the tablets. It should also be remarked that I did not leave the, the mound after penetrating through the frost until the tablets were discovered and taken from their resting place with my own hands. South of the tablets, example in the southwest corner of the grave, were found a few pieces of skull bones, of which one piece was saturated with the green carbonate of copper. Also, several pieces of human cervical vertebrae, a small bit of copper, and an artificially wrought bone. In this grave were a great number of bones of the body, and also in the northeast corner, as in the southwest corner above mentioned, some pieces of uh, skull and bones of the neck. It seems probable that here had been two skeletons, lying one with the head to the west and the other to the east but this cannot be positively determined. About two and one half feet east of the west end at the south side of the grave and about three inches from the bottom, we found a copper axe, number 21, which exhibited no indication of having been wrapped in cloth and two feet still farther east on the same side of the grave, a few copper beads, fragments of pottery, a piece of yellow pigment. A piece of mica, two crystals of dog tooth spar, some flakes of selenite, and a flint arrowhead were afterwards found as mentioned in the supplementary report. In all parts of this grave above the bones were found many pieces of rotten wood, and in one instance a piece of bone about three inches in length, apparently artificially wrought. Alright, so before we continue, we're going to take a look at a diagram of the tablet.
they have found. So this is a side view. We're going to get a better view of it, right? I just want you guys to see, right? You got to kind of flip it towards the right. Now you guys can see this is what they found in there, all right? You see the inscriptions and there's a little diagram, something going on here. They're going to explain. The two shell layers over the grave B were united toward the middle of the mound and formed a continuous layer with the shells in the southern part, showing that both of the graves were covered at the same time. These layers were lowest immediately over each grave. The shell beds are composed of the species of a river shells common in this vicinity and lying flatwise in a horizontal position and frequently in pairs, never having been separated. They extended about two or three feet beyond the graves in every direction, terminating in a border of stones fitted closely together and forming on the north and south sides a layer of about two feet in width and on the east and west sides consistent of only a single row. Over the middle of the broad layer of stones on the north side was found a bed of ashes and a number of human bones. And at the junction of the layer of shells and stones at the northwest corner and immediately beneath them a few fragments of bones with cuts or scratches like those above described found on the south side. It was remarked that in the earth near the surface of all parts of the mound were found more or less human bones showing that it was used as a burial place in comparatively modern times. The piece of pottery represented in figure 4 uh, volume 1, was found at the top of this mound, and pieces were also found at the top of other mounds of this group. It is not impossible that additional discoveries may be the reward of further explorations in these grounds when a favorable opportunity shall be presented. Continuing, it says, Report of Continued Exploration for the Academy, conducted by Mr. Gass. Having finished the further examination of the mounds of the Cook Farm Group, and particularly of Mount Number 3, conducted in the interest and at the request of the Academy, I would present the following additional report of the work. It was in this further exploration that the Copper Axe Number 21, a number of copper beads and fragments of pottery and yellow pigment mentioned in the description of this mound were obtained. The value of these articles in themselves is scarcely commensurate with the expense incurred but the opportunity thus afforded further observations upon the structure of the mound was very desirable and has given us a better understanding of the whole. And I would present my thanks to the Academy for thus having enabled me to prosecute the work to completion and to present a more full description of the entire structure. After the finding of the tablets, some intruders entered the excavation in our absence and took out some relics which, however, I was fortunate enough to obtain from them. These are a piece of mica, some crystals of dog tooth spar, flakes of selenite, and an arrowhead, which are also in the Academy Museum, with the axe and other articles above mentioned. I now have also to report that in three other places in the immediate vicinity and to the southward of this group, where mounds were supposed to exist, I have made a careful examination by boring a great number of holes and examining the earth from different depths. We found in each case a number of stones, as in the other mounds, and below these stones only sand and gravel and the hard clay, but no indications of shells, human bones, or other artificial deposits, and hence conclude them to be only natural elevations. It therefore appears that no more mounds are probably to be found south of this group, but to the northward, on Mr. Smith's land, there are a few more mounds for the exploration of which permission has not yet been obtained. For further explanation of this work, prosecuted on behalf of the Academy, I would refer to the detailed description already presented, respectfully submitted, J. Gass. A little further ahead, it says here, on the inscribed tablets found by Reverend J. Gass in a mound near Davenport, Iowa, by R.J. Farquharson, M.D., Ladies and gentlemen, you need scarcely be told that the recent discovery of engraved tablets of stone in one of the mounds of this vicinity is one of great 
even transcend in importance, not only to scientific persons, but also to the world at large. This is so important to the world at large. But guess what, guys? They hid this from us. They never told us about it. They wanted us to forget about it because this rewrites history. We are in a measure astonished at the unexpectedness of our discovery and also somewhat embarrassed with its richness for in one particular, that of phonetic writing, it seems to prove too much. All right? It proves too much. There was writing here. The only evidence we have of the existence of a people conventionally called mound builders preceding the modern Indians in the occupancy of this continent consists of material relics and of these a most abundant supply has been collected but of evidence of their language or inscriptions there are none that is none which have a clear and indisputable title to such a character however whether by fortune or misfortune it has been our lot to make the discovery and it now becomes our duty honestly and firmly convinced as we are of his genuineness and authenticity fairly to publish it to the scientific world they wouldn't be publishing this guys this is what i'm trying to say you know how many volumes of the proceedings of the davenport academy of natural sciences they are these are academic writings and reports guys they wouldn't be writing this they wouldn't be wasting their time and trying to make themselves look like fools to the rest of academics but they're telling you right now it's their duty and honestly to confirm and they are convinced as we are of his genuineness and authenticity and they want to publish this to the world for it merits there to be a judge inviting all fair and candid criticism yet deprecating in the most earnest manner the crude strictures of the hasty and inconsiderate if the characters in the cremation scene tablet plate one Remember, they're talking about this tablet right here in the bottom. There is a cremation scene. Seems like they're burning some bodies. There's a cremation going on. All right. To prove to be phonetic, if it is phonetic or even hieroglyphic, it may be and doubtless will be long before they are deciphered. It may be that from inherent difficulties, they may never be deciphered. But we must bear in mind in how very long the Egyptian hieroglyphics remain unread, that until quite recently the cuneiform inscriptions were a sealed book. So at this moment they weren't able to decipher what they were finding here. But he's reminding you that even when they started finding the Egyptian hieroglyphics, they didn't know how to decipher it. It's the same thing. He makes a great point right here. He says, here as well as anywhere. I may mention that one great objection to the reception of this or any other discovery of an inscription seeming to come from the mounds arises from the fact that most writers on American antiquities of any authority, however much they may differ on other matters, seem as one on this point that no American race ever had a written phonetic language. Some even go further and say that as no evidence of such has been found, none will ever be found. All right, that's the hijack they've been uh, teaching us all our lives. And in his time, they were doing it big time. And so people like him were finding these things and trying to tell you, hey, look, we found these uh, phonetic writing, what seems to like be old world inscriptions in these mounds. That was taboo back then. It still kind of is now, right? So he's going to point out some hijacks like Schoolcraft uh, and uh, Brant's mayor, uh, Colonel Wittesay. These are all hijacks. If you guys can pause it, right? I'm going to just go here. You go, you pause it, you read it, and he's just pointing out what they were saying, how there's no written language there's ever in America, blah, 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 blah. He says, these quotations might be greatly extended, but enough has been given to show the general drift of opinion among those writers, generally accepted as authority. So these gatekeepers, right? So now here we have uh, another of the tablets, and it shows, you know, a scene of animals, uh, men, it seems to be men hunting animals and all that. Right, and on this page it says the subject matter of this paper are inscribed tablets will now be briefly considered under the following heads a short notice of the various inscribed stones found in the United States and Canada both true and false the discovery of Davenport tablets and the evidence in our possession of their authenticity all right a description of the tablets a commentary on the calendar stone a commentary on the sepulchral rite stone and on the letters or hieroglyphics 
a commentary on the hunting scene stone and its natural history with some remarks on the question of the contemporaneous existence on this continent of man and mastodon or elephant, which we have shown that was uh, uh, very true. There is so much proof in the Americas of man uh, being in contact with elephants or so-called mastodons, right? So these are the points he's about to go over. Again, the inscribed stones. And then what he goes over here first is the Dighton Rock in Massachusetts near the mouth of Taunton River. One of the oldest and most celebrated inscribed stones. Uh, this famous inscription has been described, figured, and discussed many times in the past 200 years. At one time, it was considered a bit of Indian picture writing and no more, and which state opinion rested for a long while. It came again into importance when the question of pre columbian discovery of America was brought for forward. There are two kinds of inscriptions on the rock, one of which is apparently Indian, was so regarded by late uh, Professor Wyman and and as such was intelligently translated for schoolcraft by an Indian. The other, altogether different, is regarded as runic and is shown in the cartoon. And then they're saying that the essential parts of the inscription, according to the skillful runologist Finn Magnuson, he's a, he's a professional, right? An expert in runic writing. Finn Magnuson, to whom it was referred by Professor Rafinski, are as follows. So these are the inscriptions of the Dighton Rock. And this is what, you know, he translates, supposedly. Sign about Northmen's and Scandinavians. Are you guys see that? Right? As this reading accords almost exactly with the long lost and recently found saga of Thorfinn Carlsen, and it's accepted by the French runologists, it may be accepted as the true one. The confidence inspired by this successful reading induced the Royal Society of Antiquarians of Denmark to purchase this rock, and arrangements were uh very, were very recently being made to remove it to Copenhagen, all right? They believe it's so true, right, that the antiquarians of Denmark, the society, right, the Society of Antiquarians of Denmark purchased it. In consideration of this concession on the part of the Danish antiquaries, a granite monument is to be erected on the spot now occupied by the engraved rock, thus to commemorate the landing here in 1007 of Thorfinn, as narrated in the saga, and in the inscription, as read by Magnuson, all right, literally confirming the saga. Again, they're reading it in reverse, reading it in reverse. So then they go on to talk about, you know, which Mr. Colonel witnesses to cause archaeological frauds. This is the one of the gatekeepers, right? He's saying the Grave Creek Stone, which we already proved, you know, that came out of a mound here, has Paleo Hebrew on it. You know, Mr. Collins says, you know, it's all fake. It's all fake. <laughs> so he says the preponderance of proof as well as of probabilities is decidedly against it. You know, he don't want to even get a chance. And yet at the Congress of Americanists at Nancy in 1875, it, or rather according to Whittlesey, an imperfect copy, was read by Mr. Bain as follows. Thy orders are lost. Thou China's and thy impetuous clan are rapid as the camels. Mr. Binden adds, I not only sustain but justify the authenticity of the 23 Canaanite or Phoenician letters, Paleo Hebrew, Canaanite, Paleo Hebrew, comprising the eight words of the Great Creek inscription. It says here the three following characters on, are common to the inscription on Dighton Rock in Taunton, Mass., and to that on the Grave Creek Stone. They have the same symbols. Of the 23 characters of the Grave Creek Stone, the seven following examples, right? are according to Schoolcraft to be found among the so-called stick book. Characters of the ancient bardic, the billet of the bards of Britain. All right? It's the same. That's what they're finding with the, in the Grave Creek Stone. It's right here, it says discovery of the tablets. In this regard, there is but little to be said in addition to the account already given by the original explorers. Perhaps, however, it might be well enough to state that these tablets are from Mount Number 3, of the series already described in volume one of our proceedings, the whole dug in finding them being on the north or opposite side from the site of the former exploration. Shortly after the report of the discovery, several gentlemen officers of the academy visited the excavation and through our president, Mr. Hunton reported that from the unbroken condition of the layers of shells and from other evidences visible, they were of the opinion that no disturbance of the mound had taken place since the formation of these layers all right 
but the undisputable evidence of the authenticity of these tablets rest in the explicit statement of Dr. I'm sorry, of the Reverend Mr. Gast and the gentleman assisting him that after the penetration of the frozen crust of the earth, they did not leave the spot until the tablets were unearthed by the hands of the former. This forever silences the doubt in regard to the intrusion or interpolation of these tablets. For taken in connection with the frozen state of ground, it makes such an act simply impossible. It's so hard just to dig on this frozen ground, you know, the conditions they were digging. And they telling you all these men, they pulled it out. They pulled it out. Right? They were there. They were the ones who penetrated this frost. And they didn't leave until they removed the tablets or unearthed them by their own hands, guys. This is in the what? Proceedings of the Davenport Academy of Natural Sciences, 1879. And here's a description of the tablets, you know, what it's made out of. Uh, water, you know, 74 parts, inflammable matter, carbon, butman, uh, ashes, 610 parts. Okay. As found, the stone was split into two parts by a separation in the plane of cleavage and the upper half, the cremation scene was unfortunately broken also in two pieces by the blow of the spade, which revealed its existence and soft earth where it rested. The smaller tablet or calendar stone is composed of the same material and is in shape an imperfect square with nearly straight side of seven inches and in left. The thickness, which is not uniform, averages five eighths of an inch. The holes bored near the upper corners, apparently for the purpose of suspension, have each a diameter of three eighths of an inch. Examination of the surfaces of the stone with a magnifying glass showing the marks of the original polishing or smoothing would seem to indicate that they had not weathered much. All right. So again, describing there's also a calendar, right? Calendars. We're going to see it in addition to the representation of the plate. A very short notice of the markers on this stone will suffice. The central circle was described with the radius of one inch and the space between the outer circles averaged nearly three quarters of an inch. They say right here, if we consider this a calendar stone and the 12 signs as marking the divisions of the year, then it does not in the least resemble the Mexican and Maya calendars. If again we consider it as a zodiacal, the signs in the outer circle being symbols of the constellations along the sun's path, then, though the signs are different, yet the resemblance to the common zodiac is so great as to suggest contact with one of the many nations or races which have adopted that very ancient delineation of the sun's pathway through the heavens. This is a uh, plate two or plate three, sorry. And this is the actual uh, tablet of the calendar. As you guys can see what they're talking about. All right. Showing 12 constellations. And it's similar to many old world uh, calendars. Uh, they were saying, just so you guys can see. All right, so it says here the sacrificial or cremation scene and the letters or hieroglyphics. There is a general agreement that this represents a burning of the dead, that the mound builders practice cremation. We have abundant evidence in the burned human bones and the altar mounds, though Bancroft thinks their presence suggests human sacrifice. <laughs> That's the hijack. Not always. Doesn't necessarily. That they collected a number of bodies or rather skeletons for cremation seems quite probable. This would account for the three bodies present. La Hanta says the savages on the Long River, Mississippi, burned their dead, reserving the bodies until there were sufficient number to burn together, which is performed out of the village in a place set apart for the purpose. So this was something common, cremation, right? We come now to what is no doubt the most to most of you the most interesting part of the subject. The consideration of the letters or figures occupying the two scrolls above the cremation scene and also the corners above the scroll. I must in the first place confess my utter inability to throw any light on the subject. The mastery of the language requisite for such a purpose being entirely beyond my power. The following observations may however enable you to see the mode and direction of my groping in the dark. Counting the total number of figures, I made 98, uh, 24 in one line, 20 in the other. And 54 above the lines that do deduct in 24 repetitions, and there remain 74 separate figures. 
So here are some of the figures, you know, how many times they show up. Uh, he's saying, you have already seen specimens of the written runic and bardic character. Your attention is now called to the letters of the Phoenician alphabet. And it would require no exuberant fancy to see a resemblance between some of these and some of the characters of the Davenport tablet Phoenician what? Paleo-Hebrew. The identity or at least strong resemblance of several of these is shown in the cartoon. All right. Of what? Paleo-Hebrew. The Mayas of Central America had picture writing, but whether they had made any advances towards symbols for sound, I know not. So I have a whole video on that, how they, you know, we're talking about phonetics and turning pictograph or hieroglyphics into into words or sounds, phonetics, letters, right? Yeah, that happened in the Americas, brought out from here, so-called Phoenicians with their phonetics. So there, then it goes on to... Uh, talk about how the Mayas counted because they find in some of this on the tablets as well right as you guys can see there's this mode of numeration which has also used in the ancient Mexican writing though the language is altogether different is as follows right and they're giving you examples so 20 which is the greater unit of the numeration is counted on word by 20s and there being names for the square of 20 times 20 etc this vegismal system of counting evidently founded on the whole number of fingers and toes seems to have been confined to the Mayas, Aztecs, and allied nations elsewhere in both North and South America. The decimal system prevailed. But according to Duponso, the Indian tribes about the Great Lakes and the neighboring ones counted by fives like the Mayas. Continuing, uh, this part says the natural history of the hunting scene and the remarks upon the question of the contemporaneous existence of man and the mastodon. So in the tablet, they're saying here, of the animal kingdom, 30 individuals are represented, divided as follows. Man, eight of them, bison, four, deer, four, birds, three, hares, three, bighorn or rocky mountain goat, one, fishes, one, prairie wolf, one, nondescript animals, three. Of these latter, one defies recognition. But the other two, apparently of the same species, are the most interesting figures of the whole group. These animals are supposed by different critics to represent Shimus, Papyrus, or Mastodons, slash elephants. Right? This is what they're finding on the tablet. We will leave the upper animal out of consideration. Though he has a true flap ear like the elephant, the correctness of his drawing seems to have been spoiled by the nearness of the bison, the outlines of whose body are repeated in him. Now, taking the lower animal and measuring him, we find the following dimensions. For example, length of body, 45 millimeters. Height, 41 millimeters. Length of tail, 13 millimeters. Diameter of foreleg, near the body, 6 millimeters. Diameters of hind leg, near the body, 8 millimeters. Now, assuming the height is 10 feet, we have a length of 11 feet, a length of tail of 3 feet, diameter of the fore and hind legs, respectively, of 1.5 and, and 2 feet truly, a very a very elephant-like proportion, but the trunk and the tusks are omitted. Well, so are the eye and the ear. Yet nevertheless, we contend that no animal but an elephant has such proportions, such as the contour of the back, such legs, and such tail. The statement of the following fact may not be amiss in the connection. The modern Indians, though generally very accurate in detail, sometimes pur purposely omitted important features of an animal, as for instance, the horns of the elk, when representing the head of that animal, examples of this are to be found in schoolcraft. Again, in that otherwise truthful delineation of the mastodon, the elephant mound of Wisconsin, the artist has totally omitted the tusk and shortened the trunk to very modest dimensions. Surely not for want of space, for the whole animal has a length of over 100 feet and a proportionate height. Again, we've gone over the elephant. We're going to go over it again a little bit today, but... Again, just having a, an elephant mound logically tells you that people saw elephants, right? Anyhow, we will assume this animal to be the mastodon or at least a good enough mastodon for our purpose and proceed to treat the last portion of our subject, the contemporaneous existence of man on this continent. We will consider the evidence of that subject's seratim as nearly as possible in the order and point of time that it was brought to light by publication. So down here, there's a delegation of warriors from Delaware tribe having visited the governor of Virginia during the revolution on matters of business. After these had been discussed and settled in council, the governor asked them some questions relative to their country. And among others, 
what they knew or had heard of the animals whose bones were found at the salt licks on the Ohio, Big Bone Lick, Kentucky. Their chief immediately put himself into an attitude of oratory and with a pump suited to what he conceived the elevation of the subject, informed him that it was a tradition handed down from their fathers. That it was part of the oral history that in ancient times, a herd of these tremendous animals came to the Big Bone Lakes and began a universal destruction of the bear, deer, elks, buffaloes, and other uh, animals which had been created. That the great man above looking down and seeing this was so enraged that he seized his lightning, descended and seated him on a neighboring mountain on a rock of which his seat and the print of his feet are still to be seen, and hurled his bolts among them till the whole were slaughtered, except the big bull who presented his forehead to the shaft, shook them off as they fell, but missing one at last wounded him in the side, whereupon springing frown he bounded over the Ohio, over the Wabash, the Illinois, and finally over the Great Lakes where he is still living at this day. All right, so that's their oral tradition. Mr. Jefferson also states that a Mr. Stanley taken prisoner near the mouth of the Tennessee relates that after being transferred to several tribes from one to another, he was at length carried over the mountains west of the Missouri to a river which runs westwardly that there these bones, right, tusks, grinders, and big bones abounded and that the natives described to him the animal to which they belonged as still existing in northern part of their country, in the northern part of the country from which description he judged it to be an elephant, all right? What is that saying? That in colonial times when the Europeans got here, there were still elephants around in parts of the country. That's a big one. A recent writer in a newspaper thus speaks of the Big Bone Lick after mentioning the fact that when first discovered in 1773, mastodon bones were in great abundance on the surface of the ground. He continues, this fact affords a key to the living age of these extinct animals that has ever been a matter of conjecture with the scientific world. The bones on the surface will not last a hundred years. Listen, this is big right here. Scientists, if you're hearing right now, you know what he's talking about. You know, these bones... If they're supposed to be from the Ice Age 10, 12,000 years ago, they wouldn't be on the surface. They wouldn't be found like this. They would not last 100 years, probably not more than 40 or 50. He then adds, so that this key of the Big Bone Lake never before or elsewhere found unlocks the mystery and shows to a certainty that these now extinct giants might have been seen stalking through the forest like moving mountains with their fearful tusks glaring eyes and heads of a thousand pounds but a short time before the discovery of their remains all right so he's trying to point something out here the next link in the chain of our evidence is afforded by the narrative of dr cock who in a pamphlet published in st louis in 1840 stated that he had found the remains of a mastodon in 1838 which had evidently been destroyed by the hands of man all right so this guy has a whole report uh, that's a whole other uh, proceedings of St. Louis uh, Academy uh, of Sciences that he wrote in. So Dr. Cox is quoted right here, as you guys can see, and how he's describing what he found. If you guys pause this and read it, you guys are going to see that all the evidence states and proves that this animal was killed by men, meaning that men was with elephants. At the same time here in the Americas, because that was only thought to have happened in Europe and other parts of the world, but never in America. But there's so much evidence of that here. We've gone over it in uh, different counts. This is just some of them right here. We've gone over many in previous videos. So again, you know, you can pause that and, and take a look what he's saying. So it must be said that Dr. Cox's account met with a more favorable reception in Europe, especially in Germany. And it was not very many years before the abundant proofs of the coexistence of man and the mammoth in that hemisphere, even to a drawing of the latter animal on its own uh, ivory, forced an almost universal belief of it. We cannot trace in this country, as in Europe, the existence of man to a period when he was the contemporary of many extinct mammalia, and when the islands of land and sea and the conditions of climate over large parts of the earth were wholly different from what they are now, but he can be traced beyond the last great change where Dr. Abbott found worked flint implements in the glacial drifts of New Jersey. And he rightly infers that if man was a pre-glacial occupant of this continent, he must have been familiar with the mastodon. If they're finding evidence of man this late in America, this far back, then obviously he had to have encountered elephants, mastodons. 
the works of man have repeatedly found in this country in connection with the bones of Mastodon or of other extinct animals and his contemporaries. And then he goes on to quote Bancroft, who starts talking about the gravel pits, right, in California, which we got a bunch of videos on uh, on that as well. You know, implements wrought by human hands there and, and layers that, you know, are too old when man is not supposed to be here. Uh, great deaths below the surface, evidently of great age. Whitney found in California, 1857, the works of man with bones of the Mastodon and said there is every reason to believe that these great proboscideans, these are the ancestors of the elephants, of all the elephants in the world. And I have a whole video on the ancient animals of America, one on elephants particularly, proven that the ancestors or proboscideans of elephants, the bones were found numerously, like all over the Americas. There were so many here, guys. I mean, elephants were here abundantly all types of different elephants more than any other part of the world different types of elephants they lived at a very recent period geologically speaking and posterior to the epoch of the existence of glaciers in the sierra nevada and also after the close of the period of activity of the now extinct volcanoes in that great chain it says here that homes in south carolina in 1858 found pottery at the base of a peat bed on the banks of Ashley River in close connection with the grinder of a mastodon. All right, so again, given a lot of examples here, Hillard in Louisiana in 1867 in the salt mine of Petit Ansa Island found the works of man with the bones of mastodon. All right, so again, going over all these uh, examples, these uh, finds they have done, which they didn't tell us about in school. They never told me none of this stuff in school growing up. I would have remembered, all right? So he says, ladies and gentlemen, the last link in the chain of evidence of the coval life of man and the master on this continent bears the date of 1877 and is to be found on the face of the hunting scene tablet now before you. All right. So in these tablets, the Davenport tablets, there's a scene of them killing an elephant, hunting an elephant. All right. That the paper was illustrated by charts of ancient and modern letter characters and was referred to the publication committee. Professor W.D. Gunning was present and in response to a call made some interesting remarks in which he alluded to these archaeological discoveries as promising, very important results. Mr. W.H. Pratt exhibited a stone carving representing a human head said to have been exhumed from a well excavation at a depth of 39 feet below the surface in Hardin County, Iowa and which was sent to the Academy by the owner for an expression of its opinion. The letter accompanying left some doubt in regard to the exact location of the specimen, but Professor Gunnan expressed the opinion that it probably belonged to the era of the mound builders, as it resembles closely similar relics exhumed elsewhere. All right, so that's where I'm going to leave it now, guys. I just wanted to go ahead and read this uh, report from the original uh, people that reported and found the Davenport tablets. I hadn't done that before, and I wanted you guys to have the source, know where to find it, and, and to just see it here, so you guys can be able to share it in case you need or come back to it for reference. This ain't no fraud. This ain't just any little uh, internet uh, blog or anything like that. This is a real academic uh, book. Uh, many volumes of this. This is an Academy of Natural Sciences. These people are not just going to embarrass themselves and make themselves look bad and be ridiculed. They knew what they were writing. They know what they found. They found this with their own hands in the mounds, guys. The Davenport tablets, all right? So what I'm going to show you guys now is some more um, books talking about this and some more opinions on it, all right? Again, this was the Proceedings of the Davenport Academy of Natural Sciences, Volume 2, from 1879. Uh, the book is called The Mound Builders, Their Works and Relics by Stephen D. Pete, Ph.D. It says, member of an antiquarian society, the American Antiquarian Society, American Oriental Society, Fellow of American Association of Advanced Sciences, member of Victoria Institute, also of Société de Ethnographie, uh, core member of Numismatic Society of New York Historical Societies of Virginia, Wisconsin, Rhode Island, Davenport Academy of Sciences, 
also editor of American Antiquarian and Oriental Journal. All right, this part of the book, uh, they talk about the discovery or they made uh, in the city of Davenport. All right, so this is the information they had. They say they found several, a uh, large number of relics, uh, seashells, copper axes, pipes, hemisphere, hemispheres of copper, arrowheads, pieces of galena, pieces of pottery, pieces of mica, stone knives, copper implements shaped like a spool, rondelles shown that treponin had been practiced. Many of the axes had been wrapped with coarse cloth, which had been preserved by the copper. All right, the pies are all, all of mound builders' patterns. Some of them were carved with effigies of birds and animals. One bird has eyes of copper, another has eyes of pearl, showing much delicacy of manipulation and skill in carving. All right, this is an art. All right, these relics excited much interest and were put on exhibition before the American Association for the Advancement of Science at Detroit 1875, all right? About uh, 20 copper pipes were reported at that time and 11 copper olives and large number of bones. They were said to have been found at various depths, some of them near skeletons, some near altars, some in ashes, though they were all from the same group of the Cook Farm. The mounds on the Cook Farm were the most of them stratified. All of them contained bodies and ashes. Two or three of them contained altars or round heaps of stone, but with no relics upon the altars. Mound number three was the one in which the tablets were discovered. All right, tablets, writing. This was a low mount, about three feet high and 60 feet in diameter. All right, so here's a figure. It's gonna talk about this later on. This is uh, the hieroglyphics of one of the tablets, all right? See that? A lot of this, like this one, looks like Paleo Hebrew, what you call Phoenician, this one too. Well, actually all these right here, some of these, like this one right here. Continuing, it says the second grave was not open until the year 1877, about two years after the first. Mr. Gass was attended by a party of seven men, two of whom were students. They found near the surface modern relics, a few glass beads and fragments of a brass ring, also a layer of shells 12 or 15 inches thick. Beneath this second layer, five or six inches thick. Beneath the second layer, a stratum of loose black soil or vegetable mold. You see that? Just sounds like what they did in the Amazon. All right, talking about black soil. Kemet, black rich soil, Kemet, that's what it means, black soil. Where's the real Egypt, all right, or Tameri? All right, loose black soil, vegetable mound, 18 or 20 inches thick, and in the mold, fragments of human bones. At the bottom, they discovered two inscribed tablets, all right, lying close together on the hard clay, five in one half, feet below the surface of the mound. Both were encircled by a single row of limestones. It says the large tablet is 12 inches long from 8 to 10 inch wide and was made of dark coal slate. It says talking about the smaller tablet. All right, it says it, uh, it, says it has three concentric circles, though the signs do not the least resemble the Mexican or the Mayan calendars. The larger tablet contained a picture of either side. One represented a cremation scene, another a hunting scene. A hunting scene. The cremation scene suggests human sacrifice. Suggests, he's saying, a number of bodies are represented as lying upon the back and the fire is burning upon the summit of the mound while the so-called mound builders are gathered in a ring around the mound. Above the cremation scene is an arch formed by three crescent lines representing the horizon. And in the crescent and above it are hieroglyphic, some of which resemble the common figures and numbers and the various letters of the alphabet. There are 98 figures, 24 in one, 20 in the other, and 54 above the lines. The peculiar features of this picture are these. A rude class of mound builders are practicing human sacrifice. Mm -hmm one containing a face, the other circles and rays. Above this is the arch of the heavens with Roman numerals and Arabic figures, all right, Roman numerals, all right, what did they find in the Burroughs Cave and in Arizona, right? Where's the real Romans? <laughs> and Arabic figures, all right, we're talking about all these all these languages and glyphs they're finding in this part of the world, all right, true old world. Remember, he said this is the old world also. Let's see what else he found. The figures eight is repeated three times. The letter O repeated seven times. With these familiar characters are others which resemble letters of the ancient alphabets, either Phoenician or Hebrew. All right. So I wanted to show you this image right here. This is the Davenport tablet. Let me just zoom into it. All right. Do you see this? Do you see the glyphs? I see, I see Paleo Hebrew. I see a lot of things here. They already told you they found Arabic, uh, Roman numerals, 
Phoenician and Hebrew, right? All in one. This is in the mounds over there in Davenport. All right, we're going to get into this book real quick. It's called Pre-Columbian Resources Potentials. A Comparison of Old World and New World Petroglyphs by Margaret S. Henke for the Bureau of Land Management under the Wichi Intern Program, September 1978. Stone tablets have been found in the mounds along the trade route. One at Davenport, Iowa, was translated by Barry Fell as containing a trilingual inscription in Egyptian hieroglyphs, Iberian Punic, and Libyan scripts, all right? The Davenport tablet, and we've showed that that was an official find, an official find in the mounds. Again, it contains Egyptian hieroglyphs, Iberian Punic, and Libyan script. The Davenport calendar still, both in the scripts, and the drawings describe a ceremony very similar to the Egyptian celebration of the New Year. An elephant pipe was also found in this area. The Davenport artifacts were discredited by the Smithsonian as forgeries, but fortunately, the town erected a museum to house them. Thus, years after they were declared forgeries, Fell was able to transcribe the tablets with knowledge of the script, which had been developed after the objects were rejected. The book is called... Ancient Celtic America. It was written by William R. McGlone and Philip M. Leonard. 1986. The Davenport Stone. There's another example of old world writing in America that clearly illustrates the nature of epigraphic controversy and the degree of polarization present between opposing sides. Involved is the discovery of an inscribed piece of slate in an Indian mound in the last century. At that time, many small scientific groups or academies were formed around the country through which amateurs could engage in the pursuit of biology, geology, archaeology, and other sciences. One of the more prominent of these was the Davenport Academy of Natural Sciences of Davenport, Iowa. The academy had its own publication in which a number of the authors, in addition to its own members, published papers and it sponsored periodic meetings of small groups representing the different disciplines most popular was archaeology as this was an area noted for its indian mounds and with other opportunities for collecting artifacts all right so they found this davenport stone this is the stone right here we've shown it again in a video uh, it says here that uh, then in 1976 barry fell in his book america bc showed that one of the tablets figure 16 containing trilingual inscription and in modified egyptian hieroglyphics iberic and libyan alphabets and argued that it was epigraphically authentic he says that the latter two tell that the stones gives the secret of regulating the calendar the egyptian describes how that is done by attaching a mirror to a pillar so that it will cast a reflection on a certain stone on the march equinox and says that a festival of the new year should be held then the tablet also shows a scene he interprets as the digit festival of osiris